Okay, year 13. Um, I'm going to just talk through a couple of bits of the 2009-2011 uh, F792 papers, which you had in your batch for last week and you've received the mark scheme. So I'm just going to work with a few diagrams. I'll scroll through and talk. I may not necessarily be on the screen all the time, but I hope this uh, is it gives you some useful ways of thinking about things. So here we go, we're starting with F792, May 2009, and I'm going to scroll down to uh, question 2B, and I'm going to work a little bit with this diagram here, which is a diagram of a meandering river in a floodplain. And I'm going to just try to work out the number of depositional units and the dynamics of the river here as well. So what you've got is a meander bend, uh, and it is starting off a little bit geographical really, it's process rather than form, but as you would expect this meander bend is showing the fastest pattern of fastest water flow around the outside here, river cliff, and therefore there is erosion going on the outside and then uh, because the thalweg is there and this is slack water on the inside so that there is deposition of sand and silt and mud over there. You've also got uh, when the river goes up to bank full you'll then have silt and mud deposited out on the floodplain itself but this river because it's eroding is going uh, undergoing what's called lateral erosion so it's migrating across the floodplain and it will go backwards and forwards as the meanders as the instability of the flow makes the meanders migrate. So let's just have a look at the geological expression of that lateral migration, and we can, we can look at the earlier units of deposition. Uh, the earliest unit of deposition is, of course, down here. We've got evidence that the river has migrated across its floodplain, and these are surfaces that indicate um, progressive, what's called accretion of the point bar, the inside of the meander bend through time. So this river was migrating from left to right across the floodplain. You've then got uh, deposition of units above that. Now let's work out the order of this. The current units being deposited is clearly this one, because here are the deposits uh, being formed here by progressive migration of the point bar across, and there's the current surface. So this river is migrating that way, as you would expect. And as it migrates, it's eroding earlier units. The earlier units are below the current river. So let's count the number of depositional units. Over this side, it's eroding one, two, three units. There's a fourth unit, and there's the fifth unit. So there's evidence to show that this river has migrated backwards and forwards across this section of the floodplain at least five times in the diagram that we've got here. And each time it does that, two things are formed. Firstly, within each unit, you get a fining upward sequence with a channel lag conglomerate at the base and floodplain silts at the top. And also, you get these series of what are called accretion surfaces, which show the direction of migration of the meander through time. In that unit, it was migrating from left to right across the flood plain, plastering sand and mud on those accretion surfaces as it went. So we've got one, two, three, four, five units, five depositional units, five bits of evidence for lateral erosion through time on that river, on that meandering river section. Overall, within each one, you will have a fining upward sequence, and that is characteristic for a fluvial depositional environment. But bear in mind that that can happen in other environments too, and the one that they frequently put in exam papers to confuse you is that they may put in a turbidite deposit and a fluvial deposit. And the way you tell them apart is usually one of two ways. Turbidites will have flu marks. In general, rivers will not. <coughs> Excuse me. The other thing you look for is fossils. Turbidites will have marine fossils, especially in the C, D, and E units. 
fluvial deposits will not have marine fossils, they will have terrestrial fossils, so plants typically. One other thing to bear in mind, this could be part of a deltaic deposit, and if it is, it will be part of a cyclothem, and the cyclothem will typically have coal in it. There are your plant fossils. But bear in mind that deltas are transitional environments between the land and the sea, and therefore from time to time you can have marine transgression over the top of the delta. And with that transgression will come marine species of fossils. Let's move on. Okay, quick is through the sandstones. You'd be asked to identify these. Poorly sorted, moderately well sorted, well sorted. Angular to sub-rounded, angular to sub, well, sub-angular to sub-rounded, well-rounded. This is compositionally immature. It's got rock fragments, feldspar, a muddy matrix, and quite large class. This is relatively compositionally uh, mature, in fact it's very compositionally mature, and there are, there's nothing but quartz in there, and this one is super mature. So this is probably a grey wacky, but you would get a mark in the mark scheme, and I think you'll have seen this if you mark this as an arcos, and the reason for that is that they've given you rock fragments and feldspar. If there were marine fossils in there, it would have to be a grey wacky. There are not. But it might so happen that that turbidite did not contain fragments of fossils, so you would get credit for either. It's an immature sandstone. This one is an ortho quartzite. This one is a desert sandstone. Three typical sandstones. Don't get them mixed up and learn the difference between grey wackies and um, arcoses because obviously the deposition environment is very different. The way you tell them apart is in hand specimen and that would be that the arcos would be pinkish red in colour with prominent white quartzite fragments because it's forming in an arid environment. The grey wacky would show the dull grey brown colour of the muddy matrix which it uh, contains. Let's move on. So just a quick word about Bowen's reaction series, although I know we covered this in the lesson. You should now know the minerals in the right order, olivine and orgite there. And then uh, we've got muscovite and quartz down here. I just wanted to say something about the solid solution series. On the right-hand side of Bowen's reaction uh, diagram, we go from uh, anorthite, CA-rich plagioclase at the top, to albite, sodium-rich plagioclase here. And the key idea is that as you crystallise out calcium-rich plagioclase feldspar from the melt, the melt becomes progressively depleted in calcium and therefore enriched in sodium. And so the amount of albite, sodium-rich plagioclase feldspar, will increase in the number in uh, the zone crystals as you go down until at the bottom here, at about 750 degrees Celsius, something like that, you will have albite only being precipitated from the melt. That will not be in individual crystals usually. What you'll have is zoned feldspars. So as you go out from the initial center of the crystal, high temperature, anorthite, CA-rich plagioclase feldspar, progressively the zones will become more sodium rich. Hope that makes sense. Let's move on to the 2011 paper brief. <coughs> uh, where am I going? Oh yes, here we go. So 2011 F792, I'm just going to concentrate on two diagrams briefly. The first one is glacial. Now glacial was not 
Um, a big part of your module four work, the sedimentary environments, there were four environments there. This was not one of them, but this is included in the syllabus. So it's a bit of a funny one and you do need to learn it. It's not difficult. This does it for you. This is a graphic log showing a typical glacial sequence. Let's get the environment sorted with the evidence. So what we have got here is we've got typical till deposits here and here. So these have been deposited directly from the ice. They are unsorted, texturally and compositionally immature clastic rocks. They will have all sorts of different fragments in them. There's been no transport by water at all. These are, if you like, the deposits left behind by the bulldozer. They're jumbled, they're angular, they can contain almost anything. We've then got much more sorted sediment. These cross-bedded sands in here, and they will have conglomerates in them as well. They have imbricated pebbles, typically, and these are the deposits of braided rivers and streams. So, they will be in fining upward sequences. They're showing evidence of transport in water. Cross-bedding indicates relatively high energy conditions. They will not have a muddy matrix, typically. They will be fairly clean, washed plastic sediments with uh, a variety of grain sizes and typically rounded to sub-rounded fragments in them because they have been transported. The third type of se uh, sediment that we've got in here is this one, which is a lake deposit. It's a silt and it will have varves, seasonal varves, so that, uh, and it might have plant, plant fragments as well. So it's a very low energy environment and material is simply settling out in a proglacial lake. So you could look at this in terms of either seasons or glacial advance and retreat. The glacier advances, leaves a till layer. You then get retreat of the ice and you get um, fluvial glacial deposits, river deposits on top, which are deposited as the uh, sand, as the mel ice melts and deposits the sand on top. Then you get a lake deposit which is a temporary low energy incursion into that environment and then we go back to the cold environment again. Let's look at the last diagram. So a little bit of structural geology, very easy, and we're combining this with sedimentary structures. So all you've got to do is look at the way up of these rocks and work out the structures. So in this case, we're using graded bedding. It's normal grading, it's fining upwards. So we can then draw in some structure, hopefully. These rocks are, um, that's right way up. That is clearly inverted, and that is clearly inverted as well. So let's put in our structure which will come around like that a bit wiggly line but never mind so we've got an overfold there which has got an inverted limb right way up limb there and then we can put in a syncline oh which will come down somewhere here there we go so it's an anticline syncline pair with inverted limbs on those two sides. So clearly it's a compressional stress regime and the big push, if you like, the biggest push is coming from the east, pressing to the west. Axial planes in here, limb, 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 uh, fold hinge up there, fold hinge down there too and you've got your basic geometry. I hope that uh, makes sense. It's not too demanding, is it? Okay, I'll look at the other mark schemes and place those on YouTube uh, and Insight as appropriate. Any problems, anything you don't understand, anything you're a bit stuck on, then uh, just email me. Bear in mind one other thing, uh, the work on Bones Reaction Series, you will need to look at and understand the uh, phase diagrams which are dealt with in the textbook, both the solid solution series and also the, um, 
the other one with the, the other diagram with the eutectic, the binary phase diagram with the eutectic. Not difficult to do, just work through the examples and I'll put some examples onto Insight for you. Thanks for listening, hope that helps. Bye for now.